Hi everyone, welcome to Duality Repair. This is the ADCOM GFA 5200 amp. This is the kind of gear I really like, both aesthetically and functionally, for its simplicity. It's got just the power button on the front and the input and output on the back, and that is it. This one's obviously got a problem. I have some audio hooked up, and I'll turn it on now. Hopefully you can see the power LED is illuminated. So at least part of the power supply is working, but there's absolutely no output. I've tried uh, adjusting the volume from my source, no luck at all. So let's take the cover off. NAD circuitry. Wow, look at that. There's spider webs in there. See that? I blew out all the cobwebs, and now that we see the inside of the unit, it's about as simple as the outside. So we have, of course, the power transformer on the left. We have the power input board on the left as well with the power switch and a few other components. We have a small, small board here on the front which you can't see. You can see the wires leading to it. This is just the board that houses the LEDs for the distortion alert and thermal protection. And then of course we have our main board which houses the circuitry for the power supply and the amplifier section. I've tried to analyze this circuit just a little bit based on the schematics that I have and the schematics do say GFA 5200 but they do not appear to be correct at all. There are only a few components that appear to be correct. And it's not just the, the naming of the components that's incorrect, but the, the circuitry itself does not look correct at all. The amplifier section looks close, but the power supply section does not look close at all. And so that it, it's going to be difficult to use the schematics for this unit, which is not a big problem. Um, if we look over here, we can see a potential issue. So let's zoom in on that. In the center of the main board are these two unpopulated fuse holders, M001 and M101. Not sure about the M designation there, ADCOM. These fuses are in series with the power rails, and they are directly tied to the output transistors here. So these are MOSFETs, two for each channel, and so we'll want to check those next. Let's check the output MOSFETs for shorts. We'll start on the left at Q013. That was just charging up a capacitor. Q013 appears to be good. Let's move over to Q014. Again, charging up a capacitor. Q014 looks good too. Let's move over to the other channel to Q114. Those two pins are shorted. Those two pins are shorted. And so are those. All three pins of Q114 are shorted. Let's check the final output MOSFET Q113. Those two are shorted. And those. And those. So both Q114 and Q113 the output MOSFETs of the same channel are shorted. So those will obviously absolutely have to be replaced. It's a good idea since we're replacing these that we replace the same output MOSFETs from the other channel because if these have gone, these are probably close to going as well. We want to make sure that no other components um, around these two or these four MOSFETs have failed as well. The next most likely component to fail, since they're in series with these blown or shorted output MOSFETs, are these source resistors here. So I'm going to check those. The spec resistance for these is 0.1 ohms. It's possible my multimeter doesn't even have the resolution to pick it up. And it does on that one, 0.1 ohms, so that one's okay. From what I've seen, typically when these fail, they fail open. And that one measures okay as well, 0.1 ohms. Let's move to the other two. Again, this channel didn't show any shorts on the output transistors, but it's good to check anyway. 0.1 ohms and the final resistor here. 
0.1 ohms. So all of these source resistors are measuring just fine. The more I look at this unit, um, the more I really like it, and I, I really think I'm going to keep this. So I'm going to, of course, order and replace all of these output MOSFETs. And I'm also going to recap the entire unit. Now these have Nichicon caps, so they're good quality. But they are 85C rated, and I haven't checked, but I know this unit is, is quite old, and I think these are original, so. All the parts have arrived. It's time to remove the board from the unit. The last thing I need to do to completely remove the amplifier module from the unit is to desolder and remove the three wires from the transformer. There we go. Here's the amplifier module removed from the unit. It's in pretty good shape. I have all of the replacement components lined up next to it. Although I only have two shorted transistors, I'm going to replace all of the heatsink mounted ones. The direct replacements are still readily available and they're relatively inexpensive, so it'll be a good idea just to get all of those replaced. All of the electrolytics on this unit are still in really good shape, as I'd expect. The unit's not that old and they're Nichicon 85C rated caps, so they're, they're good caps. But it's a good idea to replace them now. I won't have to worry about them for another decade plus. Before I get started on the service, I wanted to highlight a few of the differences between the schematic and this board. So the schematic that I have is labeled GFA 5200. And it's labeled USA and Euro. I assume I have the USA version. The biggest differences come in the power supply section. So the schematic shows two transformers, T1 and T2. And I certainly only have one on this unit, the toroidal, that's in the uh, chassis. T2 in the schematic, is a, it's definitely going to be a smaller transformer. It looks like it's supplying the 12-volt rail. So I'm not sure if we have a 12-volt rail in this unit, but it is not being supplied by a transformer T2. The next big difference in the power supply section is on the secondary of the power transformer. On the schematic, we have four different bridge rectifier circuits supplying the front end left and right and the power left and right rails. On this unit, we have just one bridge rectifier here, and so I'm not sure how they're supplying the front end rails, uh, but it's certainly not with separate bridge rectifier circuits. I haven't done really any reverse engineering um, as it wasn't necessary, but certainly some major differences, at least in the power supply section of the schematic and the board. So now let's get started with replacing the components. It should be easiest if I just remove the board from the heatsink. I'll have to use this little screwdriver to remove a lot of these because uh, the, some of these components are in the way. So I can't use a standard length screwdriver. Okay, the board has been separated from the heat sink. Most of the thermal pads look okay. You can see this one looks like they maybe uh, had an oops on that one. They had to, I don't know, cut another hole in there or something. Uh, I'll probably want to replace that one. I think the others are okay, so I'll leave those alone. I'll uh, remove or clean and, and replace the thermal compound here. Uh, but let's get started with the capacitor removal. The old ball caps left behind plenty of glue, as you can see on the board. I removed the glue from the other three caps.
Now we're ready for the new caps. The amplifier module has now been completely recapped and it looks great. I thought I was ready to start removing and replacing all of these transistors here, but I found one more issue that I have to resolve first. So if we look at these center two packages, these are MOSFETs as well. Now if we look at the one on the right, we can see that its heatsink, which mounts it to the main heatsink, sits completely flush with the top of the package as it should. But the one on the left, if I pull it forward, that's as far as it goes. It's nowhere near flush to the top of that MOSFET. And so we are not getting the proper thermal dissipation through this heatsink and to the main heatsink in its current configuration. And so I'm going to do my best to heat this, uh, the solder up on this transistor and, and uh, orient it so that it's mounting flush to the heatsink as this one does. I was able to reorient that transistor so it should be just fine now. While I have both heatsinks off, I might as well remove and replace the thermal compound. The amplifier module is now reconnected to the heatsink. I'm going to remove and replace the thermal compound here. And then I'll start removing and replacing the transistors one at a time. All right, I will now start removing and replacing all of the heatsink mounted transistors one at a time. All right, I got the first transistor removed. Time to replace it. All right, the first transistor has been replaced. I'm just going to go down the line and replace all the rest of these. Finally, the amp board is complete. I'm just going to wipe down the uh, inside of the chassis before I throw this in. Clean as a whistle. All right, time to see if all of that work paid off. I finally have the amplifier module reinstalled. I have both outputs hooked up to two 8 ohm dummy loads, and I have the unit plugged in. I'm ready to turn it on now. 
I'll zoom in on the new fuses so that if anything happens, you can watch. Powering the unit on in three, two, one. Okay, it's on. The fuses are intact, so that's a great start. I'm going to let this sit idle for a while, about five minutes or so, and then I'll check the bias setup as well as the DC offset. Okay, the first bias checkpoint is at R35. I have my two mini clips hooked up to that. And it's been on and idle for a while, and we're sitting at about 15.5 millivolts. The uh, spec is 20 millivolts, so we'll see if we can adjust that by adjusting R38 right here. Pretty touchy. I'll fiddle around with this a little bit more, see if I can get it as close to 20 as possible. All right, that's about as good as I could get it, 19.5. If I go any more, it's just gonna jump to well beyond 21, so. I'm gonna move on now to test point R135. Here's R135, it's quite low at 11.5 right now and falling. So I'm gonna adjust that now at R138. I got the bias for this channel to be almost identical to the other at about 19.4 millivolts. So I'm going to move on to the DC offset now. Here's the right channel's output. You can see we have currently almost 2 millivolts of DC and uh, it looks like it's still climbing. So I'm going to attempt to adjust that down now even though it's still moving a bit with R139. Alright, it's been sitting at less than half a millivolt now for a few minutes so I'm Pretty confident this is adjusted into spec. I'm going to take a look at the left channel's output now. The left channel is behaving just like the right did. The uh, DC at the output is uh, negative, but continuing to increase, so I'm going to try and adjust it again. Okay, everything is checking out pretty good. I think we're ready for the sound test. All right, I've been running this now for about 15 or 20 minutes, and it's sounding fantastic. I'm excited to put this in use. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.